Okay, welcome everybody. This is um, the back end of the respiratory chapter from before we took our break and had the COVID-19 outbreak. And so what we're talking about now are the mechanics of how the respiratory system works as opposed to the, um, the components of it, right? So we, we talked a little bit about um, the four processes that are involved in the, um, the functioning of the respiratory system. Pulmonary ventilation, which is gas movement between the atmosphere and the alveoli. Um, an alveolar gas exchange, where the gas actually moves from the alveoli into the blood. Transport, which is the movement of the gases in the blood itself. And then the gas exchange at the, at the tissues, systemic gas exchange, which is the movement of the gases from the blood into the tissues themselves. Now, we've addressed the fact that the reason we need to breathe is because we need that 20% of oxygen in the air in order to load into the blood and for the blood to deliver to the tissues so that they can use that oxygen to make enough energy to run the body. Okay, If, if that doesn't happen, then the result is going to be um, not enough ATP to maintain cell division and repair and growth, and the result is going to be that cells and tissues will die. Remember that you make 20 times more energy in the form of ATP per molecule of glucose when there's oxygen around versus when there isn't. Okay, So when we're talking about ventilation, um, what we're doing is we're moving the air in and out of the lungs, and the main muscle that does this is the diaphragm, which sits just below the lungs, and is a skeletal muscle that's innervated by the phrenic nerve. Okay, The way this works is that we inhale when the diaphragm flattens, and that's when it's contracting, and that creates a negative pressure around the lungs, and that creates a negative pressure in the lungs, and that pulls air into the lungs. That's inspiration. Right? Oxygen then diffuses from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries across the respiratory membrane, Blood from the lungs is going to transport oxygen to systemic cells once it returns to the heart from the lungs, entering first the left atrium, then the left ventricle, and then it's going to be pumped into the aorta. And then once we get into the systemic capillaries, the oxygen is going to diffuse across the thin capillary walls and into the tissues at the same time that carbon dioxide is moving from the tissues into the blood it will diffuse initially into the red blood cells, but then be converted very quickly into carbonic acid, and then that will break apart into carbon bicarbonate and protons. Uh, the protons will bind the proteins in the plasma and in the red blood cells, while the bicarbonate will be transported out of the red blood cells and remain in the plasma and act as part of the body's buffer system. The carbon dioxide is primarily transported as bicarbonate in the plasma because ions are more soluble in water-based solutions than a nonpolar gas like CO2. Okay, And so this is the mechanism that allows us two things. It allows us a buffer system, but it also allows us a way to move the waste gas in large quantities from the tissues ultimately back to the lungs. Once we're at the lungs, the gradient for CO2 favors the movement of CO2 into the alveoli across the respiratory membrane. Bicarbonate is converted into carbonic acid by combining with protons, again catalyzed by an enzyme in the red blood cells, car carbonic anhydrase. And then the carbonic acid breaks apart into CO2 and water, and the CO2 is going to move into the alveoli, and the water will basically stay in the plasma, and then we blow off that CO2 rich air into the atmosphere. Okay, so this just shows you the basic flow. Right, it's gradients that drive this. Right, the fact that oxygen is more concentrated in the air that we breathe than in the blood that's coming to the lungs from the heart helps us to load oxygen in the lungs, and the fact that the blood that's coming to the lungs from the heart is higher in CO2 then the air that you breathe allows the CO2 to move into the alveoli and to be exhaled. Okay? Without these gradients, we wouldn't get sufficient movement of the gases 
in the direction needed. Okay? We have to get rid of the CO2 because if we allow it to build up, then what's going to happen is um, a toxic condition in cells and tissues that will eventually kill them. Um, the pH will drop in the body to the point where we're going to acidosis, and then that can lead to death. Okay, And the reasons for that include the disruption of membrane potential and the denaturing of protein. Pulmonary ventilation is made up of inspiration, where we pull into air into the lungs when the diaphragm contracts, and expiration, which at rest is a passive process that occurs when the diaphragm is no longer contracting. Okay, And this is the result of a change in the pressure around the outside of the lungs from negative to positive. All right? And the negative pressure around the lungs pulls air in. The positive pressure around the lungs is going to push the air out. Okay? Quiet breathing or eupnea is the rhythmic breathing at rest. Uh, forced breathing uh, is vigorous breathing that comes with exercise. And usually here, um, we have to call on additional muscles in order to engage in forced inspiration and expiration. And we'll talk about what those are in a bit. There are nuclei in the pons and the medulla oblongata that operate the diaphragm when we're not consciously exerting control over it. And these take over at night when we're asleep so that we can continue to breathe. Skeletal muscles contract and relax, and that changes the volume of the thorax, which has a fixed amount of gas in it. And remember that volume and pressure are inversely related, so that as volume of the chest cavity goes up, the pressure in the chest cavity goes down and vice versa, okay? And that's the mechanism that drives the air movement. That's what generates the ventilation. Volume changes result in changes in pressure gradients, and air is always going to move down its pressure gradient from high to low, okay? Air enters the lung when you inspire and exits when you expire, okay? Quiet breathing involves simply the diaphragm and external intercostals which will contract when you inspire. Well, in forced inspiration, um, you're going to call on um, the sternocleidomastoid scalenes, pec minor, um, serratus anterior, the internal and external intercostals, okay, uh, primarily the external intercostals, and then, um, of course, the diaphragm. Uh, is going to be a major player here as well, and also the erector spinae. Okay? And so these are going to flare the rib cage out and up, and that's going to increase the volume of the thoracic cage, and that's going to produce um, a greater negative pressure that will pull more air into the lungs. In forced expiration, we have to use our abdominal muscles. Okay, so the internal and external obliques, the transverse and rectus abdominis, okay, and also the internal intercostals, and that is going to help us to blow more air out when we exhale, okay, so they're going to pull the rib cage down medially and compress it, and the abdominal muscles are actually going to push your internal organs up against your diaphragm, and that's going to let you blow more air out, and you can see the muscles involved here, okay, but again, during quiet breathing, the main driver is the diaphragm, okay? Um, a couple of other terms referred to in breathing include dyspnea, which is labored breathing, and apnea, which is a cessation of breathing, right, where breathing stops. Volume changes in the thoracic cavity um, result in pressure changes inside the thoracic cavity. Uh, vertical changes are the result of the change in the the contraction of the diaphragm, it flattens when it contracts, and that enlarges the chest cavity, and when relaxed, it goes back to a domed shape. For relaxed breathing, it only re requires small movements, but in forced expiration, the abdominal muscles cause more movement of the diaphragm upward um, by kind of pushing on it, right? So the diaphragm's relaxing, the internal organs are pushing up against the diaphragm, and that shrinks the cavity even more and let you blow out more air. And you can see that here, okay? So when we inspire, right, there's your thoracic cavity and the diaphragm flattens and the external intercostals pull up and out and the result is that the 
chest cavity expands, that creates a negative pressure around the lungs, and that pulls the air in. And then when we blow out, we expire, the diaphragm relaxes, and the chest cavity shrinks. Uh, the internal intercostals compress the chest cavity, and the air goes out. Okay, um, So this would be quiet breathing, right? not forced. When it's forced, we have to use those other muscles. Lateral change in the um, chest cavity, the rib cage, will widen the thoracic cavity when you, when you inhale, and rib cage depression narrows the cavity when you breathe out. Changes due to activity of all breathing muscles except the diaphragm are going to uh, result, again, in either a, um, a more extensive ventilation or a more rapid respiratory rate, okay? Anterior posterior dimension changes. Um, the inferior part of the sternum moves up when you inspire and back when you expire. And the activity level of all the breathing muscles except the diaphragm um, will, again, reflect the, um, the change in volume in the thoracic cavity. So here what we have is a, a discussion of the gas laws. Um, the bottom line, okay, is that there's a, there's a gas law that I like to use when talking about the, uh, the physics involving ventilation that kind of covers all of these different gas laws, and it's called the, um, the perfect gas law, okay? And it's a, it's a pretty simple, um, pretty simple law. Yeah, let's use red, and let's use a pen. Okay. And it's simply PV equals NRT. Okay. And the way this works is that P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles of gas, R is a constant, and T is temperature. Okay. And this covers all of the Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Avogadro's Law, all the laws that relate to gas. Bottom line, okay, um, the smaller the volume, the higher the pressure, okay. The um, higher the, the volume, the less the pressure. Again, this is for a fixed amount of gas. The more moles of gas you have, the more pressure you've got. The higher temperature you've got, the more pressure you have, okay. Um, you can rearrange the equation so that um, it looks like this. Pressure is equal to NRT over V. And that allows you to see the inverse relationship between pressure and volume. And it also sort of drives home the point that when the volume goes up, the pressure goes down, and vice versa. Well, when the number of moles of gas or the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up, okay? So when we're talking about a pressure gradient, the movement of gas will always be from high to low pressure. That's true for a liquid. That's true for a gas, okay? Um, the term that goes with that is that nature abhors a vacuum, right? So what will happen um, whenever you have a negative pressure somewhere is that the fluid or the liquid or the gas will rush in to fill the vacuum, okay? Um, when we're talking about atmospheric pressure, we generally measure it um, using units. The units include atmospheres and millimeters of mercury or tor, okay, um, or PSI. So, bottom line, at sea level, Atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, which is the same as almost 15 pounds per square inch PSI, which is the same as one atmosphere. So you can even use those as conversion factors if you like. Um, the, the millimeters of mercury thing might 
throw you a little bit. And this comes from the fact that um, when, we, when we measure pressure, atmospheric pressure, we use a device called a barometer, which is a U-shaped glass tube that's closed at one end and open at the other. And then inside the tube is mercury. And we make the mercury, I don't know, gray. Yeah, that's a good choice. And let's see. We're going to change the uh, thickness of the line here. Put that color there. Hmm. Yeah, let's go with this. Okay. And so the mercury kind of sits in here. Mercury is one of the two metals that's a liquid in temperature. And uh, it is gray looking. This is the mercury inside the, the tube, the barometer. And then what you have out here is a um, just a scale. It has millimeter marks on it going up. And the closed end of the glass tube is under a vacuum. Okay. So what happens here when the force of the atmosphere pushes down on the open end of the tube, okay? That would be blue arrows, atmospheric pressure, is it pushes the mercury up in the other side. And we measure the number of millimeters high the mercury is as an indication of the atmospheric pressure, and 760 millimeters of mercury works out to be one atmosphere. Okay. So what happens with um, atmospheric pressure is that gas movement stops when the pressure inside the lungs is equal to atmospheric pressure. So there's no more net movement at that point. When the pressure inside the lungs is less than atmospheric pressure, air will move into the lungs. And when the pressure inside the lungs is greater than atmospheric pressure, the air will move out. Okay, And that's the mechanics of ventilation. Alveolar volume is the volume of the alveoli. Interpulmonary pressure is just the pressure in the alveoli, and it changes when we breathe. It can be higher, lower, or equal to atmospheric pressure. And that is what drives the air movement. Okay? It's equal to atmospheric pressure at the end of inspiration and the end of expiration, and that's where net movement of gas stops. Okay? Intrapleural pressure is the pressure in the pleural cavity, and it changes as we breathe. It's lower than intrapulmonary pressure, um, and this helps to keep the lungs inflated whether we're breathing in or out. It's about four millimeters of mercury lower than intrapulmonary pressure between breaths. The volume changes the pressure gradient and air flows with its gradient, right? So during inspiration, um, the pressure gradient is such that atmospheric is greater than the pressure in the lungs and the air flows in. And when we expire, that's reversed, okay? And so this is why it's called negative pressure breathing, right? Because it re relies on the production of a negative pressure in order to promote the air movement. So you can see here the different pressures, right? You've got alveolar volume in the lungs. This is the pleural cavity. The pressure um, between the lungs and the pleura is about 756. Atmospheric pressure is about 760. So even when net movement has stopped, what you're going to see is that the lungs will remain partially inflated, okay? So what drives it is the change in pressure in here, okay? And that's the result of the change in the dimensions of the thoracic cavity, which is produced by the muscles of breathing. In quiet breathing, intrapulmonary pressure and atmospheric are equal, with the intrapleural pressure 4 millimeters of mercury lower so that the lungs can stay inflated. The diaphragm and external intercostals contract, and that increases the thoracic volume. Diaphragm counts for two-thirds of the volume change in the intercostals for the remainder. The intrapleural volume goes up, so the intrapleural pressure drops. The lungs are pulled by the pleura, so lung volume increases, and intrapulmonary pressure goes down. 
because the interpulmonary pressure is less than atmospheric pressure, the air flows in until the pressures are the same. Usually about 500 mL is the amount that gets pulled in in a quiet breath. That's half a liter. Okay. When you breathe out, interpulmonary and atmospheric pressure are equal. Interpleural pressure is about 6 millimeters of mercury lower, and that, again, keeps the lungs inflated. The diaphragm and external intercostals relax, and that decreases thoracic volume. The pleural cavity volume decreases, so intrapleural pressure increases. Elastic recoil pulls the lungs in. Alveolar volume goes down, and intrapulmonary pressure goes up. Because the intrapulmonary pressure is greater than atmospheric, that's going to push the air out of the lungs, and that's ventilation. Okay? So that's quiet inspiration and expiration. Okay? And again, note that at all times, the, the, there's a pressure differential between the thoracic cavity and inside the lungs themselves that keeps the lungs inflated, okay? whether we're breathing in or we're breathing out. Okay, you can see here the changes in volume and pressure in a normal breathing cycle, right? Volume changes in the lung during one breath. When we breathe in, the volume goes up, and when we expire, the volume goes down, okay? Not a surprise. And then when we're talking about here the pressure in interpulmonary pressure, this is the pressure in the lungs, the value drops, okay, as we're breathing in, and then it equalizes with atmospheric at the end of the cycle, and then it goes up when we breathe out, and then equalizes at the end of the cycle over there. And then the interpleural pressure is going to remain below the interpulmonary at all times, but it will drop as we inhale, right? and rise again as we exhale, okay? But we'll stay below the pressure that's in the lungs so that they remain inflated. In forced breathing, we have to call in additional muscles, right? When we're doing forced inspiration, we call in the sternocleidomastoid, the pec minor, the um, serratus anterior, the erector spinae, the scalenes, okay? Um, and the external intercostals, and that, along with the diaphragm, pulls more air in to support a greater um, rate of activity, right? Because the more air you pull into the lungs, the more gas exchange you can do, the more oxygen you can load into the blood, the more oxygen you can deliver to the tissues in the same amount of time, okay? The other thing that usually happens with forced breathing is that the rate will go up as well. So you can take more breaths in a certain amount of time in addition to taking deeper breaths. Okay. Autonomic nuclei are going to coordinate breathing and they're in the medulla and the pons. The medullary centers are two groups, the ventral and the dorsal group. Uh, the ventral group is in the front of the medulla, the dorsal is in the back, and then the pontine group called the pneumotaxic center is in the pons. Okay. And so all three of these nuclei, which are just clusters of nerve cells, are in communication with each other. And these neurons are going to influence the rate of contraction of the respiratory muscles as well as the length of contraction of the respiratory muscles. The ventral respiratory group neurons are going to talk to the lower motor neurons of skeletal muscles in the spinal cord. And those lower motor neurons are going to talk to the diaphragm through the phrenic nerve and to the intercostals through the intercostal nerves. There are chemoreceptors in the medulla that monitor the pH of cerebrospinal fluid, which changes as CO2 crosses the blood-brain barrier and produces carbonic acid in the CSF, which then gives off protons and drops the pH. Okay? So the more of that that goes on and the lower the pH gets, the more the central chemoreceptors are going to signal the muscles of breathing to increase the length of time that they contract, and also to increase the rate at which they're doing this, right, so that you can breathe deeper and faster to blow off more CO2 and to bring the pH back up, okay? Um, 
carbonic anhydrase is present in the cerebrospinal fluid to catalyze the reaction of CO2 and water. And it's CO2 that's the main driver of the rate and depth of respiration in most cases, right? Peripheral chemoreceptors in the aorta and in the carotid artery are going to change as a result of uh, pH shifts or changes in uh, respiratory gases in the blood. They respond to pH produced independently of CO2 as well as from the presence of CO2. Um, for instance, when you go into ketoacidosis, you can go into something called Kusamol respiration in which you breathe harder and deeper in order to try to compensate for the shift in pH. Carotid chemoreceptors are going to send signals to the respiratory center through the glossopharyngeal nerve, while, auto, while aortics are going to go through the vagus. Okay, And again, it's pH and CO2 levels that are the main drivers here. And the reason for that is that um, CO2 is going to dissolve more easily in the plasma, and thus changes in CO2 levels are going to be detected more easily by peripheral chemoreceptors, and the same with pH, okay, because they rely on charged molecules or, or um, ions in order to um, detect the shift in the blood chemistry. Oxygen only is a driver at extreme levels, and that's primarily because oxygen does not dissolve very well in plasma, okay, so that's why it has to be carried in hemoglobin in the blood. Other receptors that influence respiration. Irritant receptors in air passageways are stimulated by particulate matter and makes us cough and sneeze. The baroreceptors in the pleury are going to respond to stretch. So something called the herring brewer reflex keeps the lungs from overinflating and bursting and that allows us to continue to breathe without ripping the lungs apart. And then proprioreceptors are stimulated by body movement and accelerate our rate and depth of respiration. So you can see all the players here, right? There's the dorsal and the ventral group, and there's the pontine group, right? And then there's all the inputs from peripheral chemoreceptors, right? And the outputs to the skeletal muscles that promote breathing, okay? And then, of course, the central chemoreceptors that are monitoring that cerebrospinal fluid pH. Okay. In quiet breathing, Inspiration starts when the ventral respiratory neurons fire spontaneously. Signals are sent from this group of neurons to nerve pathways that excite, excite the skeletal muscle. The diaphragm and external intercostals contract. That produces a negative pressure that lets the air flow into the lungs. Quiet expiration occurs when this group of neurons is inhibited. Signals from inspiratory neurons are relayed to the VRG expiratory neurons. Expiratory neurons send inhibitory signals back through negative feedback. Signals are no longer sent to the inspiratory muscles and the diaphragm and the external intercostals relax and the air flows out. Okay, So that's quiet breathing, right? The ventral respiratory group is the main player. This is called eupnea and you average between 12 and 15 breaths per minute uh, as a resting respiratory rate. The pontine center is going to promote smooth transition between inspiration and expiration. It sends signals to the medullary center, and we've noted that damage to this region can cause irregular breathing. Okay, so this is the pontine group is like the switcher. Okay, from dorsal to ventral. Apnea is cessation of breathing, and it can occur by holding your breath, it can be drug induced or it can result from disease or trauma. Okay, so an example of this is sleep apnea. There's two kinds of sleep apnea. There's central and obstructive sleep apnea. This is when you stop breathing when you're asleep. In obstructive sleep apnea, your upper airway closes and risk factors include obesity and pregnancy and old age. And you generally wake up sucking air, right? Um, the fix for this is to lose the weight or to have the baby um, or to wear a CPAP, which is a mask over your face that pushes air into the lungs, generating a positive pressure so you can continue to breathe at night without your airway closing. Okay? Um, central sleep apnea is different. In central sleep apnea, for reasons we don't understand, those nuclei in the brainstem fail. 
and the result is that the diaphragm quits moving and you stop breathing and you die in your sleep. And we think this is a, um, a contributing factor to something known as SIDS, okay, which is an acronym that stands for Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Okay? We don't understand why, exactly why SIDS occurs. It's sort of a blanket category when no cause of death can be determined in the child. We just chalk it up to SIDS, and we think that central sleep apnea is a major player here. And this is why mothers of newborns are told to always put the baby in the crib on their back. That's not to prevent central sleep apnea, but that's to at least lessen the risk of obstructive sleep apnea because the baby often doesn't have the musculature in the neck to lift the head off the pillow and continue to breathe. Okay. Around reflexes, it can alter our breathing pattern. Chemoreceptors change our breathing pattern by sending signals to the dorsal respiratory group, which are then relayed back to the ventral. The ventral triggers changes in the rhythm and force of breathing. Rate changes by altering the amount of time for inspiration and expiration in the depth by the stimulation of the accessory muscles, right? Because, again, the diaphragm doing its thing is basically for quiet breathing. The accessories are when we're doing the forced inhalation and expiration. Ventilation is going to increase when the pH of the body drops, or the CO2 levels go up, or the oxygen levels drop, okay? And the result of that is that we're going to get more, more um, air coming into the lungs in order to get more oxygen into the blood and to eliminate more CO2. And by eliminating more CO2, we bring the pH back up. To where it was before, okay? And so this is why the main drivers of ventilation rate are pH and CO2 levels. Ventilation decreases if chemoreceptors are going to pick up decreases in protons or in CO2 levels, okay? Blood CO2 levels and pH are the most important driver of breathing rate. Raising the CO2 level by 5 millimeters of mercury will double the breathing rate. CO2 changes are going to have an impact on central chemoreceptors by, again, producing carbonic acid and generating protons and dropping the pH in the CSF. Blood oxygen levels are not a big regulator of breathing, and the reasons are, as we indicated, right? Oxygen just doesn't dissolve very well in plasma. Okay, it's carried in the hemoglobin. So blood oxygen levels have to really shift a lot in order for this to have an effect on our breathing rate. Arterial oxygen has to go from 95 to 60 millimeters of mercury to have a major effect independent of CO2 levels. When oxygen drops, it causes peripheral chemoreceptors to be more sensitive to blood CO2 levels. Okay, and so here again, we see that the CO2 is a big driver. Hypoxic drive is what happens when the oxygen levels become the main driver of breathing. And it occurs in respiratory disorders like emphysema because we have something called gas trapping, right? Where because the airways are occluded due to mucus or scar tissue or what have you, inflammation, um, it's harder to get the air out of the lungs in a normal breathing cycle, which means that carbon dioxide rich air stays in the lungs and that causes CO2 levels in the blood to stay high. The chemoreceptors get less sensitive to CO2 changes and so oxygen becomes the driver by default. So what we do is we give oxygen to elevate the oxygen levels and interfere with the person's ability um, to breathe on their own. Um, this can result in uh, severe respiratory problems or even killing the patient, okay? So, again, decreased oxygen um, is going to be the driver here. This is an unusual situation, okay? This is a result of a disease state. Altering breathing can also be the result of proprioreceptors, okay? That signal respiratory centers to increase the depth of breathing. Baroreceptors in the visceral pleura and bronchial smooth muscle send signals 
to the respiratory center to avoid overstretching and rupturing of the lungs, which would cause them to collapse, and that's a condition called telectasis. And so this is called the Herring Brewer reflex, right? It shuts off inspiration and protects against overinflation. Irritant receptors initiate sneezing and coughing. Exaggerated intake of breath followed by closure of the larynx and contraction of abdominal muscles and opening of the vocal cords to get the air out. And the idea behind this is just to get rid of the irritant, okay, whether it's a particulate or a pathogen. Okay? The hypothalamus can increase breathing rates if the body is warm and it works through the respiratory center, while the limbic system is our emotional hookup to the rate and depth of breathing. It can alter the rate in response to emotions and also works through the respiratory center. The frontal lobe of the cortex can voluntarily change breathing patterns. This bypasses the respiratory center and goes straight to lower motor neurons directly. Right? So this is our voluntary control over skeletal muscle that we have. Okay? So there are emotional hookups and there are conscious hookups that can control the rate and depth of breathing. Right? Remember that your limbic system is basically your emotional brain. The respiratory system includes smooth muscle and glands that are innervated by axons of the floor motor and autonomic neurons, controlled by autonomic nuclei. Breathing muscles, however, are skeletal muscle that are innervated by lower motor neurons in the somatic division of the nervous system. They are controlled by the brain stem, autonomic nuclei, cerebral cortex, and the somatic nervous system. Okay. Thus, there are both reflexive and conscious controls that are going to affect our breathing. Now, the smooth muscle in the respiratory system is found around the bronchioles and around the blood vessels and it's also found um, in the trach, okay? And the main um, effect here in the blood vessels and in the bronchioles is to direct air and blood to meet up in the lungs in the most effective way possible so that we do oxygen loading and CO2-1 loading as efficiently as we can, okay? Whereas um, in the trach, it's part of um, what, what promotes coughing and sneezing, okay? The airflow is just the amount of air moving in and out of the lungs with each breath, and it depends on the pressure gradient. It's created between atmospheric and interpulmonary pressure and resistance in the lungs that are going to be a property of the airways and the chest wall, um, and a few other factors, okay, such as um, the condition of the surfactant, okay. Flow is um, going to be directly proportional to the pressure difference between two regions of a gas or liquid filled chamber that are connected and the resistance between those regions. So the greater the resistance, the less the flow. The greater the difference in pressure, the greater the flow, okay. So the idea here is that you can change the flow rate by changing the resistance, and the easiest way to do that is to change the diameter of either the bronchioles um, in terms of the airflow or in terms of blood flow, um, the diameter of the blood vessels. Okay? The pressure gradient is the difference between atmospheric and intrapulmonary pressure, and we change this by changing the volume of the thoracic cavity. Tiny volume changes allow about half a liter of air to enter, and that's what I call our tidal volume. If the accessory muscles of inspiration are used, the volume increases and airflow increases because of the, the, the bigger pressure gradient. Basically, when you change the dimensions of the chest cavity um, more extensively, you're going to generate a greater pressure difference, and as a result, you're going to promote more flow. All right. Resistance uh, can be changed by changing the elasticity of the chest wall and the lungs, changing the diameter of the bronchioles, and collapsing the alveoli. Okay? So the more elastic the chest wall and the lungs are, the less the resistance. The, the more bronchodilation you have, the less the resistance. Um, the less the alveoli tend to collapse, the less the resistance. Okay? So... so Chest wall elasticity goes down as we get older because of scar tissue and because of um, 
changes in the uh, range of movement of the joints of the thoracic cage um, and arthritis, right? Bronchial diameter is going to vary with resistance. Bronchial constriction is going to increase resistance. Bronchial dilation is going to decrease resistance. Constriction is caused by a parasympathetic innervation through vagus nerve, okay, um, or as a result of histamine, which promotes inflammation, or cold temperatures. And you can also have blockage by mucus production and inflammation, which is, again, triggered by histamine. Bronchodilation is going to decrease resistance, and that's through uh, postganglionic sympathetics and through the release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla and from the postganglionic sympathetics. Right? And that's why people who are asthmatic will frequently have a, um, an epinephrine inhaler in order for them to bronchodilate when they have uh, exposure to a trigger that causes their airways to close up. And it makes sense if you think of fight or flight because you have to have bronchodilation when you're in fight or flight to get more air into the lungs, to get more oxygen into the blood, to get more oxygen to the muscles in order to deal with your situation. Okay, so that makes sense. Collapsed alveoli are going to increase resistance, but the type 2 alveolar cells produce a detergent-like secretion called surfactant that acts like a, almost a soap and overcomes hydrogen bonding from the moisture inside the lungs and makes it easier for the lungs to expand and contract. Okay, um, if we mess up surfactant production, such as when we have a premature infant or if we have a condition called cystic fibrosis, we have respiratory distress syndrome, right, where it's difficult for us to get a good breath in and out. In IRDS, infant respiratory distress syndrome, what happens is there's not enough surfactant made and so we have to give the preemie surfactant in order for the lungs to be able to expand so they can get air in. In cystic fibrosis, the surfactant is made improperly, and the bacteria that's in the air we breathe colonize the surfactant and grow in it, and as they die, they thicken it, and that blocks air movement and clogs airways, right, and thickens the respiratory membrane. And the result is it's very difficult to breathe. And so we have to clear the uh, surfactant out of the lungs in order for breathing to resume. You can do that with an infant by holding the infant upside down and hitting them on the back and having them cough up the, um, the surfactant. As an adult, we use a device called an AmbiVest, which looks like a life jacket and plugs into a power supply and vibrates at a high rate. And that allows us to cough up the mucus. And we also use... Um, not mucus, but surfactant. And we also use um, inhalers that break up DNA and thin the surfactant so it's easier to clear because DNA is the primary molecule released when the bacteria die that thicken the surfactant. Okay. CF is a um, genetic disorder. It's an autosomal recessive, so you have to have two copies of the gene to have the disease. Uh, and the gene was actually characterized at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We can detect it through amniocentesis. Um, but we have no way to repair the genetic defect at this time. Compliance is just the ease with which the lungs and the chest expand, and it's determined by surface tension and the elasticity of the chest and the lung. The easier the lung expands, the greater the compliance. Conditions that increase resistance to flow include decreases in the size of the lumen of the bronchioles, decreases in compliance, the result is more forceful inspiration, which can enlarge the uh, muscles of breathing, right? More forceful inspirations of uh, respiratory disorders require more energy. It can cause a four to six-fold increase in the need of energy. Individuals with these conditions can get exhausted very easily. So when we're talking here about these conditions that affect pulmonary efficiency, they fall into two broad categories, right? There is obstructive pulmonary disorders and restrictive pulmonary disorders. And in an obstructive pulmonary disorder, we have blockage of the airway, and that's going to result in a reduction in your wind speed. And so what that means, it takes longer for you to get air in and out of the lungs, and sometimes you can't get all the air in or out of the lungs in a normal breathing cycle. Okay, um, A lot of times these people will have a barrel chest. Okay, They're, They tire very easily. 
examples of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, um, the early stages of emphysema, okay, the early stages of silicosis and anthracosis, um, all of those can um, clog the airways. An example of a reversible obstructive pulmonary disorder is asthma, where you get exposed to your trigger and you get inflammation and mucus in the airways, and it's hard for you to pull air into the lungs. And the fix for that is an epinephrine or an albuterol inhaler. Um, restrictive disorders are different. In a restrictive disorder, the lungs can't expand the way they would like, and the result is that your um, the maximum amount of air that you can pull in and blow out of the lungs called your vital capacity goes down. Okay. Um, examples include the latter stages of emphysema where the lungs scar and become less elastic, the latter stages of silicosis and anthracosis, which is black lung disease and, and um, um, the uh, silicosis is just basically silicone in the lungs, silicone fibers. Um, and then um, the latter stages of cystic fibrosis, okay? The scarring is going to impede the ability of the lungs to open up. Other conditions that contribute include obesity, um, fluid in the lungs, such as in pneumonia, um, air in the thoracic cavity, which causes lung collapse, okay, atelectasis. Um, all of those will be restrictive disorders. And then some diseases get you both ways, right? Some diseases start out as obstructive and then advance to obstructive restrictive, such as in emphysema and cystic fibrosis, okay? So bottom line is that we, we test this with spirometry, okay? Pulmonary ventilation is just the uh, normal quiet breathing, the amount of air you move in in a normal breath. The tidal volume is the amount of air per breath, and the rate is the number of breaths per minute. So your tidal volume times your respiratory rate is your, is your minute respiratory volume, okay? It averages about 6 liters a minute for an average adult. Your anatomical dead space is the conducting zone space that doesn't do any gas exchange, and the average um, respiratory uh, setup is going to have about 150 mil of dead space. And the alveolar ventilation is the amount of air that reaches the alveoli per minute. This is the tidal volume minus the anatomic dead space times the respiratory rate. That's your alveolar ventilation. That works out to about four liters a minute. And deep breathing will maximize this, right? Because you'll get more air into more parts of the lungs. Normal anatomical dead space plus any loss of alveoli is physiological dead space. There are disorders that reduce the number of alveoli that participate in gas exchange because of damage to alveoli or respiratory membranes, such as in pneumonia. Well, anatomical dead space is physiological dead space in a healthy person where the alveolar loss is minimal. But again, a lifetime of using your lungs will always result in a reduction in the amount of available surface area for gas exchange, even if you're not a smoker or don't work in conditions that expose you to um, air that contains particulates. Okay. So over time, all of our lungs are going to scar. Spirometry is just used to assess these different volumes, right? So the volumes that are critical in spirometry are tidal volume, um, inspiratory reserve, and expiratory reserve volume, um, and then residual volume, okay? So these um, volumes can be combined in order to produce capacities, okay? So you can see the different capacities here, okay? Other volumes include forced expiratory volume, which is the percent of vital capacity that you can blow out in a set period of time. Your FEV1, for instance, is the percentage expelled in a second, okay? And this is the, this is the value that goes down when you have an obstructive disorder, okay? Is your FEV over your FVC, your forced vital capacity. Between 75 to 85 percent of vital capacity uh, in a healthy person, where you see less in emphysema patients and those that can't properly expire, right? And these would be individuals with 
various degrees of obstructive disorder. Maximum voluntary ventilation is the greatest amount of air that can be taken in and expelled from the lungs in a minute. Breathing as quickly and deeply as possible. It can be as high as 30 liters a minute. All respiratory disorders are going to cause this value to go down. Okay? Obstructive because the wind speed goes down. Restrictive because the vital capacity goes down. Okay? So this is a look at the different lung capacities and volumes. Okay? And what I want to do now is um, have you watch a little explanation of how spirometry works and what these different lung capacities and volumes are. Lung volumes and capacities, with the exception of the residual volume, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity are measured with a spirometer. Most spirometers used today are computerized systems that utilize a differential pressure transducer to make measurements that are converted to volumes and flows. These volumes and flows are then displayed on a computer monitor in text and graphic form. The individual pictured here is undergoing a spirometry test. Wearing nose clips, she makes a tight seal with her mouth on the mouthpiece. The technologist then instructs her in performing a variety of maneuvers that will result in the measurement of the lung volumes and capacities. Typically, the patient will be instructed to breathe normally and then to take a deep breath all the way in. She will then be instructed to exhale completely. This can be done slowly for a slow vital capacity measurement or rapidly for a forced vital capacity measurement. Lung volumes and capacities are measured using a slow vital capacity maneuver, while air flows are measured using a forced vital capacity maneuver. Pictured here is the spirometry tracing showing all four lung volumes, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume, as well as all four lung capacities, inspiratory capacity, vital capacity, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity. We will discuss each of these separately. The tidal volume is the amount of gas an individual inspires or expires during normal, quiet breathing. So as you sit there breathing normally, in and out, that's your tidal volume. Normally that volume is 3 to 4 mLs per pound, or 7 to 9 mLs per kilogram, of ideal body weight which is about 8 to 10 percent of the total lung capacity. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of gas that an individual can inhale above a tidal inspiration. So as you're sitting there and you make a normal tidal inspiration and then take a deep breath all the way in as far as you can, that's an inspiratory reserve volume. Normally it is 60 percent of the total lung capacity. The expiratory reserve volume is the amount of gas that an individual can exhale beyond a tidal expiration. So as you're sitting there and exhale normally and then push all the gas out that you possibly can, that's your expiratory reserve volume. Normally it is 20 percent of the total lung capacity. The residual volume is the amount of gas remaining in the lungs after a maximal expiration. So as you're sitting there and you blow all the way out as far as you can, the amount of gas that remains in the lungs is the residual volume. Normally it's 20 percent of the total lung capacity. The residual volume cannot be exhaled so it cannot be measured directly with spirometry. The inspiratory capacity is the amount of gas that an individual can inhale starting at a tidal expiration. So as you breathe out normally and then take a big deep breath all the way in, that's the inspiratory capacity. Therefore it includes the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. You might take an inspiratory capacity before jumping into the water so that you can stay underwater longer. Normally it is 60 percent of the total lung capacity. The vital capacity is the amount of gas that can be exhaled after a maximal inspiration. So what you would do is take a big deep breath all the way in and then blow it all the way out as far as you can and that would be a vital capacity. Therefore it includes the inspiratory reserve volume tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume. The functional residual capacity is the amount of gas remaining in the lungs after a tidal expiration. It includes the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. 
Normally, it is 40% of the total lung capacity. The FRC cannot be measured with spirometry because the RV cannot be exhaled and therefore it cannot be measured directly. The FRC has to be measured indirectly using helium dilution, nitrogen washout, or body plethysmography. The total lung capacity is the amount of gas in the lungs after a maximal inspiration. So if you take a big deep breath in and hold it, the volume of gas in your lungs is the total lung capacity. Therefore, it includes the inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and the residual volume. Normally, it is about 6,000 mLs for adult males and 4,200 mLs for adult females. Okay, this is sort of a revisitation of um, the gas laws. Dalton's law is just a statement that um, the um, in a in a gas mixture, right, the amount of pressure that's produced by a particular gas in a gas mixture is equal to the percentage, the molar percentage of that gas in the mixture. As an example, okay. Um, our air that we breathe is 20% oxygen at sea level. The total pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so the amount of pressure from the oxygen in the air that we breathe would be 20% times 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, turns out that that um, almost 80% of the gas of the air we breathe is nitrogen, which is biologically inert for us. So each gas moves independently down its own partial pressure gradient in gas exchange. Um, so the oxygen is moving down the oxygen gradient, the CO2 is moving down the CO2 gradient, and they don't, they don't affect each other, right? And the assumption that you make here is that the, the gases don't, don't chemically react, and they don't in the air, okay? Okay, so the total pressure times the percentage of gas is the partial pressure, right? I told you nitrogen was about 80% of the gas in the air, so the pressure from nitrogen is going to be 597, right? The pressure from oxygen is going to be 20% times 760, okay? So the partial pressures added together are going to equal the total atmospheric pressure. The total pressure in a mixture of gases is just the sum of the partial pressures, okay? Gradients exist when the partial pressure for a gas is higher in one region than another region that are connected. Okay? That's for a liquid or a gas. The gas moves from high to low pressure. In both types of gas exchange, the gradients are what drive this, right? Alveolar gas exchange is between blood and pulmonary capillaries and alveoli, while systemic is between blood and systemic capillaries and systemic cells. Okay? So, in the body, the reasons for partial pressures in the alveoli differ from atmospheric pressure, right? Air from the environment mixes with air in the anatomic dead space. Oxygen diffuses out of the alveoli into the blood. CO diffuses, CO2 diffuses from blood into alveoli. And there's more water vapor in the alveoli than the atmosphere. In the alveoli, the percentage and partial pressure of oxygen are lower than in the atmosphere. And the percentage and partial pressure of CO2 are higher. The partial pressure of respiratory gas normally stays constant. Okay. In systemic cells, partial pressures of gases are going to reflect the rate of cellular respiration, which involves the rate of use of oxygen and the production of CO2. The percentage of oxygen uh, will be lower and the CO2 will be higher than in the alveoli. Under resting normal conditions, the partial pressures remain constant. So in circulating blood, gas partial pressures are not constant. Oxygen enters the blood in pulmonary capillaries while CO2 leaves, and oxygen leaves blood in systemic capillaries while CO2 is going to enter. Okay, So you can see what's happening in the different parts of the body. Right, The partial pressure gradient in the alveoli is going to promote the movement of oxygen out of the blood and into 
or, or promote the movement of oxygen out of the alveoli and into the blood and the movement of CO2 in the opposite direction. Well, in tissues, those gradients are reversed. Okay, so um, let's let's look at some gas exchange principles. Whether you're racing in a triathlon or doing something less strenuous, you need to breathe in oxygen to help you get energy and breathe out carbon dioxide, a waste product. When you inhale, your diaphragm and rib muscles contract, increasing the volume of your lungs. When you exhale, these muscles relax, decreasing the volume of the lungs. When the lungs expand, air pressure in the lungs drops, causing air to flow into the lungs. When lung volume decreases, air pressure increases, causing air to flow out of the lungs. Air enters the nose or mouth, moves down the trachea, and goes into the two bronchi. Air moves down smaller and smaller bronchioles until it reaches a tiny sac, an alveolus. Each alveolus is surrounded by capillaries. Oxygen diffuses from the alveolus to the blood, and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood to the alveolus. As blood flows through the capillary, it becomes rich in oxygen. In the blood, oxygen diffuses into a red blood cell and binds to hemoglobin, a protein made up of four subunits. One oxygen molecule can bind to each subunit. Oxygen-rich blood flows from the lungs to the heart. which pumps this blood to capillaries all over the body. Here, we see oxygen diffusing from a capillary's red blood cells into a muscle cell. Oxygen is used by the cell's mitochondria to produce ATP during cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is released. How does carbon dioxide leave the body? Carbon dioxide diffuses from cells into capillaries. Some carbon dioxide stays in the plasma, the liquid part of the blood. Most carbon dioxide, however, enters red blood cells. Some carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin. The rest is converted to bicarbonate, which diffuses into the plasma. This oxygen-poor blood flows back to the heart. which pumps it to the lungs. There, carbon dioxide diffuses from the plasma into the alveolus. Bicarbonate enters red blood cells and is converted back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also released from hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the red blood cells into the plasma and into the alveolus. When you exhale, air flows out of your lungs. And that's how you release carbon dioxide, get oxygen, and keep on running. Okay. Henry's law states that at a specific temperature, the solubility of a gas in a liquid is dependent on the partial pressure of the gas in the air over the solution and the solubility coefficient of that gas in the liquid. Okay, so bottom line, the greater the pressure of the gas over the liquid, the more gas you're going to force into that liquid and the greater the solubility coefficient. 
the more gas is going to dissolve into that liquid. An interesting point, though, about gas dissolving in liquid is that also there's a temperature factor, right? And the lower the temperature, the more gas you can dissolve into the liquid, provided that the liquid is a water-based solution. Okay? Partial pressure is the driving force that moves the gas into the liquid, and it's determined by the total pressure and the percentage of gas in the mix. An example, CO2 can be forced into soft drinks under high pressure, and it has a higher solubility coefficient in water than oxygen does. Okay, And that's why um, we need a special carrier for oxygen in the blood, and that's what hemoglobin is, and that's what's found in the red blood cells. The solubility coefficient is just the volume of gas that dissolves in a particular volume of liquid at a given temperature, and it's a constant that depends on the gas and the liquid we're considering. Okay. Gases vary in their water solubility. CO2 is 24 times more soluble than oxygen, which shouldn't be a surprise to you guys, right? This is why, again, um, it's easy to carbonate a beverage, but it's, it's relatively difficult to put the same amount of oxygen in a beverage. Okay? Um, and you know the temperature effect here, right? If you want a pop to go flat, all you got to do is warm it up, right? And that should tell you that the higher the temperature, the less soluble the gas is in the liquid, okay? Whereas the colder it is, the more soluble it's going to be, right? So the CO2 is going to dissolve um, as a gas better than oxygen will. Nitrogen is about half as soluble as oxygen. It doesn't normally dissolve in significant amounts in the blood. Gases with low solubility require big pressure gradients in order to push them into the liquid. Okay. Now, that's not to say that there is no nitrogen in your blood. There is. Okay. Um, but it's not nearly at the level of dissolved oxygen gas. An example is a condition known as decompression sickness, right? And this occurs when a diver um, breathing air at atmospheric pressure goes below the water to a great depth and forces nitrogen into the blood because of the high pressure. The dissolved nitrogen can bubble up solution if he comes up to the surface too rapidly. Okay, and So his blood will literally boil and he'll die. We can treat this with a hyperbaric oxygen chamber where the partial pressure gradients for the oxygen go up. Additional oxygen can dissolve um, in the blood plasma, and this can be used for disorders including carbon monoxide poisoning as well. Um, we talk about carbon monoxide a little bit in, in class already. The reason it's so dangerous is because it's odorless, colorless, and tasteless, and is about the same size and shape as an oxygen molecule, right? And it binds hemoglobin and the electron transport chain more tightly than oxygen does and can displace the oxygen, and that results in less oxygen being transported in the blood and um, the poisoning of the electron transport chain, which means very little ATP production, and that will result in death in a relatively short period of time. Um, and so this is, the, this is the reason why you need a, a carbon monoxide detector in your home in order to pick up um, carbon monoxide levels in your house, right, because you're not going to be able to smell it or see it or taste it. Um, CO is generated from incompletely burned kerosene or gasoline, okay? And so this is one of the risks, for instance, of people that use kerosene heaters in poorly ventilated areas. Oxygen movement, again, is the result of the difference in partial pressures of oxygen in the air and in the blood and in the tissues and in the blood, right? The partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is 104 millimeters of mercury, and then the blood that's coming to the lungs from the heart, it's 40. So the oxygen's going to move from the alveoli into the blood. It's going to cross the uh, membranes of the RBCs, and it's going to bind hemoglobin. And at the same time, the CO2 is going to move in the opposite direction because the gradient is reversed for CO2 in the lungs. This movement of oxygen down its gradient continues until the oxygen partial pressure is equal 
in the alveoli to that in the blood, and that's when we reach equilibrium. And the levels in the alveoli remain constant as long as fresh air is continuing to come in, right? CO2 is going to go the other direction. Partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli is 40 millimeters of mercury. In the pulmonary capillaries, it's 45. So the gradient's not as steep, so the movement is going to be slower, okay? The flow is going to be less. CO2 is going to diffuse from the blood into the alveoli down its partial pressure gradient and continues until blood levels equal levels in the alveoli. The levels in the alveoli remain constant, okay? So, again, what we're doing here is we're, we're filling a gap, right? CO2 that gets blown off as we exhale is going to cause a need for more CO2 to be pulled out of the blood and into the alveoli in order to satisfy the, uh, the equilibrium equation shown here. CO2 <coughs> plus water. Gives us carbonic acid. This is an equilibrium, so it goes in both directions. H2CO3. Which will become bicarbonate. charge, and then a proton. Okay, so in the alveoli what's happening is that we are, we're taking this, right, and we're blowing it off, right? And Le Chatelier's principle, which states that when you stress an equilibrium reaction, the reaction responds so that you maintain the ratio that that reaction wants will cause more carbonic acid to be produced to generate more CO2 to fill the hole that's being created when this is expired. Expired used to be XP here. Okay. <coughs> and there's enough time <coughs> in a typical capillary um, to um, Get, get the CO2 out that's being produced by the metabolic activities in the tissues, okay? But there's a lot of spare bicarbonate as a buffer system in the blood as well, okay? So several things are going on, right? We are producing carbonic acid um, by carbonic anhydrase, catalyzed um, production of H2CO3 from bicarbonate and protons. The CO2 that's produced by the carbonic acid breaking apart, again, carbonic anhydrase does this, um, is moving into the alveoli and being blown off. The same is happening with any dissolved gas CO2 that's in the plasma. And in addition to that, um, the CO2 that's bound to the protein in the plasma and in the, in the uh, our red blood cells is also um, detaching from the protein and flowing down its concentration gradient and into the alveoli and getting blown off, okay? So all that's going on at the same time. We talked about the fact that um, in the lungs, the uh, smooth muscle action on the blood vessels and in the bronchioles adjust so that the, uh, the air and the blood meet up in the lungs in the most effective way possible in order to maximize the efficiency of gas exchange. So the idea here in the lungs is that the areas of the lungs that are most well perfused with blood are going to be most well ventilated, while the areas of the lungs that are most well ventilated are going to be the ones that are most easily perfused. Okay, And so the perfusion is um, responding to the oxygen levels in the alveoli, right? Where there's high oxygen in the alveoli, the perfusion goes up, right? The, um, the, the vasodilation, all right, is responding to um, the 
the change in um, in the oxygen levels while the, the, the bronchodilation, bronchoconstriction is responding to the change in blood flow, right? So the greater the blood flow to that region of the lung, the more bronchodilation you're going to see. By the same token, the more perfusion you have to a region of the lung, um, the more bronchodilation you're going to see, right? So vasodilation follows bronchodilation, vasoconstriction follows bronchoconstriction, okay? Okay, so um, the idea here is to maximize the, the area of the lung available for gas exchange so that it happens in the most efficient way possible. Emphysema is the result of a disease that starts out as an obstructive and then advances to an obstructive restrictive disorder. Emphysema results from cigarette smoke paralyzing the uh, cilia that line the trachea that causes the particulate-laden mucus to then drop down into the lungs and that coats them, okay? The air passageways get inflamed. You get destruction of elastic connective tissue in the lungs. You get decreased alveoli. Alveoli get destroyed. And the result then is that you move from an initially obstructive to an obstructive restrictive disorder um, that results in a great decrease in the efficiency of pulmonary ventilation. Um, it's linked 100% to smoking, okay, um, for those people that smoke and get it. And then sometimes there's a condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that can also promote emphysema in non-smokers, but this is rare, okay? It's a recessive disorder, okay? Autosomal recessive. So you have to have two bad genes in order to have this condition. Um, in the early stages, the lungs will clog and they will coat with junk from the cigarette smoke and from the mucus, right? And in the latter stages, you'll get destruction alveoli of alveoli and scarring. So obstructive to obstructive restrictive. And this is just a look at how ventilation perfusion coupling works, right? The bronchioles dilate, right? And this is going to happen with increased CO2 within the bronchiole, right? If we have decreased CO2 uh, in the bronchiole, then the bronchiole will constrict, okay? At the same time, the arterioles will dilate when there's increased oxygen or decreased CO2, and they will constrict when there's decreased oxygen or increased CO2. Okay? So the chemical changes in the air in the bronchioles is going to trigger both smooth muscle changes in both the, uh, the blood vessels and in the bronchioles themselves. Other diseases that reduce the efficiency of oxygen and CO2 exchange. Um, examples include lung cancer, where healthy tissue is replaced by tumor tissue. Thickened respiratory membranes that can result from congestive heart failure and pleural effusion, which is fluid in the lungs, which looks like a whiteout on a chest x-ray. And changes in ventilation perfusion coupling, such as in asthma or in a pulmonary embolism. Asthma, again, is that reversible obstructive disorder, in which you can't get air into the lungs because the airways are filled with mucus and inflamed, right? Pulmonary embolism is where we have lack of blood flow to a region of the lung because we've ruptured a blood vessel, okay? These diseases result in decreased blood oxygen and increased blood CO2 levels. Oxygen is going to move out of systemic capillaries and enter systemic cells it's down its concentration gradient because in systemic capillaries oxygen is constantly being consumed during metabolism and we're creating water and CO2 and energy and heat right and acids so in the systemic cells the oxygen levels are around 40 millimeters of mercury but in the capillaries it's 95 so the movement's going to be from capillaries to systemic cells. And this will continue until the oxygen levels in the capillary blood and in the tissues are the same, so until we reach equilibrium. 
systemic cell oxygen levels as a result stay fairly constant because oxygen is delivered at the same rate that it's used unless we're doing strenuous activity in which case we can go into anaerobic respiration which is kind of a dangerous place to be. CO2 is going to move from systemic cells into the blood so CO2 created from metabolism moves from the cells across the capillary membrane into the plasma across the membrane of the red blood cell and then converted into carbonic acid and then bicarbonate and protons and the bicarbonate is going to be shoved into the plasma in exchange for a chloride molecule while the uh, protons are going to bind to hemoglobin and plasma proteins okay some of the CO2 is going to be carried as dissolved gas and some of the CO2 is going to bind to plasma proteins and to hemoglobin okay and it turns out that when pH levels are low and when CO2 levels are high and when temperatures are high that hemoglobin holds on to its oxygen less tightly and unloads more of it to the tissues and that's exactly what we want and that is a property of hemoglobin that's described by something called the Bohr and the Haldane effect and in the alveoli those conditions are reversed right and so the hemoglobin is more likely to bind the oxygen and become fully oxygen saturated okay? so those are the gradients that drive the process and the diffusion continues until the blood CO2 levels are equilibrated at 45 millimeters of mercury okay? so here you can see changes in partial pressures in the blood right alveolar gas exchange movement of CO2 down its gradient okay systemic gas exchange movement of CO2 down its gradient okay here we're going down our gradient from blood to alveolar air and here we're going down our gradient from systemic tissues into blood right okay. and then oxygen levels right in the alveoli the oxygen partial pressures are low okay in the blood and they're high in the air and so the oxygen is going to move from the alveolar air into the blood and then in the tissues the oxygen levels are high in the blood and low in the tissues and so the oxygen is going to move from the blood into the tissues okay so not a surprise blood's ability to move oxygen depends on the solubility coefficient of oxygen which is much lower than co2 but primarily the presence of hemoglobin which is an oxygen binding pigment in red blood cells that contains a prosthetic group called a heme and an iron atom in the middle of the heme where the oxygen actually binds 98 percent of oxygen in the blood is hemoglobin bound oxygen bound hemoglobin is called oxyhemoglobin and it's bright red well unsaturated hemoglobin is called deoxyhemoglobin and is a dark red which looks blue through the white walls and veins we can measure blood oxygen levels with a pulse ox which clips onto your finger um, it measures hemoglobin saturating by, saturation by determining the ratio of oxy to deoxyhemoglobin normal reading hemoglobin saturation around 95 percent so basically what this does it's a device that measures the redness of the blood okay and the redder the blood the higher the oxygen content CO2 transport we already discussed right in CO2 we have another gas that is more soluble in plasma than oxygen is but still not real soluble okay um, and so the main way it's transported is is bicarbonate it gets converted into the carbonic acid inside the red blood cells and then that gets converted by carbonic anhydrase into bicarbonate and protons the protons bind plasma proteins and hemoglobin and the bicarbonate moves out of the red blood cell and goes into the plasma in exchange for a chloride ion Okay. and that becomes part of our body's buffer system and also the major way that we move CO2 into plasma 70 percent of it moves this way the remainder is either bound to plasma proteins or to hemoglobin okay about 23 percent and then a little bit of it is as dissolved gas okay okay so you can see the movement here right 
the exchange of chloride for bicarbonate that you see at the level of the membrane here, up here, right, is to maintain charge across the membrane, right, so that we still have membrane potential. But bottom line is that ions dissolve more easily in water-based solutions than a nonpolar gas does, and so that's why we move it as an ion. Hemoglobin is going to transport oxygen attached to the iron group inside the heme, CO2 that's bound to the globin, and hydrogen ions bound to the globin. Okay? The binding of a substance to hemoglobin will cause a change of shape in the molecule because this is a protein that has quaternary structure. <coughs> and so as you bind CO2 and hydrogen ions to sites other than where the oxygen goes, you change the shape of the hemoglobin so it more easily gives up its bound oxygen. Whereas if you force more oxygen in by increasing the concentration of oxygen, you're going to cause the hemoglobin to, to bind less tightly to its CO2 and to its hydrogen ions. Okay, So it's sort of like a push-me-pull-you effect, an allosteric effect. And that's what's part of the, the Haldane and the Bohr effect on hemoglobin. The conditions that persist at tissues tend to promote oxygen unloading from hemoglobin and conditions that persist in the alveoli tend to promote oxygen loading. Okay? And so those oxygen unloading conditions again are low pH, high CO2, higher temperatures. Okay? All right. So in the hemoglobin oxygen saturation curve what you see is a is an S-shaped curve that reflects the fact that hemoglobin is ha, has quaternary structure. It's made up of four polypeptide chains, two alphas, two betas, each having a heme, and in each heme an iron, and bound to each iron, uh, depending on the degree of saturation, is an oxygen molecule. Okay, And as you bind that first oxygen, the change in shape of that chain causes changes in shapes of the remaining chains that makes it easier for the other oxygen molecules to bind. And that's why that part of the binding curve is so vertical, okay? And then at higher saturations, you have more of a flat part of the curve where the saturation happens at a slower rate, okay? Percent saturation of hemoglobin is critical to our survival, okay? Um, saturation increases as oxygen levels go up because of cooperative binding, and that produces this S-shaped curve that you can see here, right? So you can see the the oxygen pressure, partial pressure in millimeters of mercury, right? And you can see the percent saturation of hemoglobin. You can see that they, they basically both go up together, but you can see that in this part of the curve here, right, where we really take off, all right, what you're exhibiting is cooperativity, right? So at, at that early part of the curve, right, where the percent saturation of hemoglobin is low and the oxygen levels are low, the binding um, is, is promoted, okay, so that you get that first oxygen in there, and then the other sites open up, and that second oxygen goes in more easily, okay, and then the subsequent oxygens are going to go in at a lower rate, okay, but these are conditions in resting tissue, and up here are conditions in the alveoli, okay? So you know what's going on where, right? Large changes in saturation occur with tiny increases of oxygen at low partial pressures, that vertical part of the curve. At high oxygen levels, uh, higher than 60 millimeters of mercury, see ch tiny changes in saturation. Hemoglobin saturation is about 98% in pulmonary capillaries as oxygen is around 104 millimeters of mercury there. Saturation can only reach 100% at pressures above one atmosphere, which is what you'd see, for instance, in a hyperbaric chamber. Okay. What can cause the graph to determine saturations at a given oxygen level? Well, at 5,000 feet, which is sea level, basically. <coughs> Alveolar oxygen is around 81 
millimeters of mercury, which is a hemoglobin saturation of 95%, but up in the mountains, um, it's about 40 millimeters of mercury, so you're 75% saturated. And so this is one of the reasons why in thinner air we make more hemoglobin so that we can bind more oxygen so that we can provide it to tissues so that they can continue to work, right? And so that's why your blood thickens in thin air after a few weeks because of the production of erythropoietin by the kidneys that targets red bone marrow that makes more red blood cells. Altitude sickness is just a physiological effect from the low oxygen levels. It includes symptoms including headache, nausea, pulmonary edema, and cerebral edema. Okay, and so these are oxygen saturation shifts um, that usually result from a relatively rapid change in oxygen levels. Some oxygen is released from hemoglobin at the systemic capillaries. It's 98% saturated as it leaves the lungs and about 75% saturated after it passes the tissues. So 25% of the transported oxygen is released. Your oxygen reserve is just the amount of oxygen that's still hemoglobin bound after it's been through the tissues. And it provides additional oxygen delivered under increased metabolic demand. Okay, um, If you exercise a lot, the saturation will drop a bit, leaving capillaries and active muscle. You may be only 35% saturated if you're, say, sprinting or or power lifting, all right? And this is also responsible for the five minute window that you have when your heart stops, okay? You got five minutes, which is your oxygen reserve, um, before you have irreversible brain damage and death, um, and that's coming from the oxygen that's bound primarily to your hemoglobin. And once that's gone, then the tissues begin to die. High temperatures diminish hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen, and low pH does the same. Okay, and we've already discussed the Bohr effect. Okay, that's the pH effect. 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate is a molecule that's made in red blood cells under anaerobic conditions, which binds hemoglobin and causes it to release oxygen. And that makes sense because if you're doing anaerobic respiration in the red blood cell, that means that you're in a region where the oxygen levels in the surroundings are low, and so you need to release the oxygen bound to the hemoglobin so that the tissues can use it. Other hormones that stimulate erythrocytes to make this include thyroid hormone, epinephrine, human growth hormone, testosterone. Okay? CO2 binding to hemoglobin causes the release of more oxygen, and that's the Haldane effect. Okay, Oxygen causes a conformational change in the hemoglobin that increases the amount of CO2 that can bind. All right? So as CO2 moves in and oxygen moves out, it's the shape change promotes the release of oxygen. And then when we flip this, right, and there's less CO2 and more oxygen, then we're going to force the CO2 out. Okay? So the Haldane effect is the CO2 effect, and the Bohr effect is the pH effect. Shifts to the saturation curve that move it to the right are going to increase, are going to promote a reduced affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen, while those that shift it to the left are going to promote an increased affinity. Okay, and again, we've discussed these, right? High temperatures, um, low oxygen concentration, high CO2, low pH are all going to promote the release of oxygen to the surrounding tissues. Okay. And then when those are, variables are flipped, we shift the curve back to the left. Okay, So you can see the shifts in the curve here. Okay, So note, as the curve moves to the right, what's happening? We're giving up the oxygen more easily. As the curve moves to the left, less easily. Okay. Hyperventilation is where you increase the rate and depth of respiration above what the body demands. And this can be caused by anxiety or high altitude. Um, oxygen levels go up, CO2 levels fall. Additional oxygen doesn't go into the blood because the hemoglobin is already pretty much saturated. There's more loss of CO2 and this is produced a condition called hypocapnia. The low CO2 causes vasoconstriction, so blood vessels 
uh, reduce the oxygen delivery to the brain, and you can faint. Okay. It can also decrease blood hydrogen ion concentration and generate respiratory alkalosis. It can cause dizziness, numbness, tingling, cramps, and tetany. If we have prolonged disorientation, if, if we do this for a long time, we hyperventilate for an extended period of time, say, you can have loss of consciousness, coma, and death. Okay, now, why? All right, well, um, again, you're changing the pH. And as the pH shifts, you're changing membrane potential. You're also running the risk of denaturing protein. And the result is cell and tissue death. Okay. Hypoventilation is breathing too slow. We can call this bradypnea, or too shallow, which is hypopnea. It causes, causes can be airway obstruction, so COPD, right? Pneumonia, injury to the brain stem. Oxygen levels go down, CO2 levels go up. Blood oxygen levels drop, and that's a condition called hypoxemia, and that leads to low oxygen in tissues, which is hypoxia. And blood CO2 goes up, and we call that hypercapnia. Okay? This results in less oxygen delivery to tissues, results in increased hydrogen ion concentration and respiratory acidosis, which causes lethargy, sleepiness, headache, polycythemia, which is an increase in red blood cell count, Cyanotic tissues, which have a blue cast to them, and that reflects the lower oxygen saturation in the hemoglobin. And if it's prolonged, convulsions, loss of consciousness, and death. And again, why? Okay, here two things are going on. You're shifting the pH, number one, right? And so the same complications that result from respiratory alkalosis, messing up protein shape, and screwing up membrane potential, are in play. In addition, you have less oxygen, right? And so the result of that is less ATP production and then tissue death. Okay. When you're exercising, you go into hyperpnea in order to bring in more oxygen and meet the tissue needs of the elevated activity level. The depth of the breathing increases while the rate remains the same. Blood oxygen and CO2 levels remain constant. Increased cellular respiration is compensated by deeper breathing, increased cardiac output, and more blood flow. The respiratory center is stimulated either by proprioceptive sensory signals in response to movement, motor output from the cortex to the respiratory center, and the fact that you anticipate the exercise. Right. So a few things are going on here. Right. You, you've got the conscious input into the the respiratory center, you've got the conscious input to the muscles of breathing, but you also have an increase in epinephrine levels from the sympathetic autonomics and from the adrenal medulla, okay? And that's also going to promote <coughs> accelerated <coughs> respiratory rate and heart rate. Okay, um, that brings us to the end. Um, I will see everybody in the next podcast. Uh, remember to keep an eye out for the adjusted lab assignments, um, which will appear as PDF forms that you will fill out in order to get points, as well as the uh, lecture exams, which will show up as connect assignments in the exams area. Okay, uh, So just wait for those things to pop. They will. And uh, I will see everybody in the next podcast. Stay healthy.